Well, two weeks ago, I introduced the epistle of 1 Peter to you. If you'd turn uh, to that, I just couldn't get past that word, Peter. Sorry. I thought I would do part two this morning on Peter. No. We, we looked at the Lord's beautiful, the way he shepherded this man, and he made him a rock that was founded on him and him alone that the early church would use as its faithful leader. And we saw the most uh, defining time of Peter's life was when Jesus told him that he would betray him three times. And Peter said, no way. Even if all of these, all these other apostles fall away, I never will. He trusted in his own love and strength and depth of it, uh, one of the most crucial missteps that one could, could make uh, in, in following after Jesus Christ. It isn't my love that's going to sustain me. It's his love for me. And so we all know the story that he ended up betraying Christ three times. The rooster crowed and he went out and he wept bitterly. And so now what do you do with Peter? Well, Jesus restored him publicly in front of these, all of those whom even if they fail, my love never will. And he establishes him and he calls him now, shepherd my flock, tend my lambs. Be, be the shepherd of the church now, Peter. Christ comes and he takes a very fallen, broken leader and he restores him and he becomes a mighty man for the kingdom of God. Now Peter has risen to the task by the power of the Holy Spirit to be the rock, the pillar for that early church. And he's being called upon to write a letter to a scattered church, which uh, in this verse one was modern day Turkey. And on the eve of this great persecution that's about to come upon the church by Nero himself, where he'll begin killing and crucifying Christians and all the torture that he could come up with is right about to take place to this church. And so the persecution, this persecution would eventually even take Peter's life and his own wife as a way of testimony by crucifixion. This morning, we're going to begin to look at Peter's introduction then to these churches. And I personally believe this to be one of the greatest introductions of any uh, in the book of the Bible, except maybe Genesis and John would be hard to beat. But wait till you see the feast that God is going to lay in our lap in these first two verses. So this could take a little while to get through. Let me just read it. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens, they're scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. This is um, some deep doctrine as Peter opens this up. We, we need this. L li little ditties are not going to help when Nero starts to rage upon the church. Five easy steps to overcome anxiety are not going to work when you're now going to be hung up on a cross for your faith. And so I want you to come with me and labor to fight to understand this truth, to build a foundation to your faith that will stand the test of time. That's what Peter's trying to establish in these scattered churches. And that's what we're looking as it's beginning to increase and grow in our own country. God established me and it's not going to come just raking leaves or with weak things. It's going to come with the, the depth of what Peter's going to reveal to us in these first two verses. It's unbelievable. It's going to call us to think on these things. Here's the man who many people said he acted and then he thought. And now after his brokenness and restoration, he says, think and think deep. Gird up your minds and then act. Be those who think deeply and understand the things of God and act upon them. So let's take it up and let's um, see what God has for us this morning. And I'm going to ask him to reveal and to illumine and transform us uh, just in this introduction this morning. So let's go to our God and ask favor and his mercies upon us. Father, we thank you for the testimony of our dear brother, for what he has testified is a man who has built his life on the rock. And when the storms came, it has not fallen. You have sustained him. You have met him. You are giving him grace in the hardest of trial. 
God, we thank you for it. It increases every one of our, our faith. We, we love to see how sufficient you are from every trial that will be brought into our lives. Here's a man saying, I am not strong, but my God is, and I pray that that would be the testimony of every heart here this morning. I pray, God, that you would meet us in a powerful way with what we are going to look at in these next few weeks. Lord, let this introduction build a foundation to us that will persevere in the days that are coming upon us. God, I thank you. Uh, for First Peter, I thank you that you restored this fallen man. I thank you that you have used him now as your instrument to write this letter to a persecuted, suffering church. God, use it in our own lives. Um, let, us, let us be open and let your word just transform and change and teach us. And so this morning, meet us by the power of your Holy Spirit through this word to change and transform lives truly. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's start with who Peter's writing to. He says he's writing to those who are scattered. The, the Greek word is diaspora. And it's this term usually referred to the Jews who were living outside their homeland. They were living outside of Palestine. And so the Jewish nation had been exiled many times in history. The, the Babylonians conquered them, the Assyrians. There were many times where they were taken away from homeland and they became the, the name, the diaspora. Peter uses it now, though, to show Christians who are living away from their homeland. Christians who have been dispersed around Turkey, most likely because of the beginning persecutions. And so listen to how Peter describes them in verse 1. He are, he's, this group are those who reside as aliens, parapedemois, those who are aliens. So here is a huge key and a major piece, I believe, to understanding this letter is this word aliens. I, I think the whole book is written to say, how do you live as aliens in a world that we don't belong in? So we need to get this term, understand it. It's going to be crucial to our thinking and to our Christian lives. And so when you hear the word aliens, what comes to your mind? Little kids, are you excited right now? Pastor is preaching about aliens. Daddy, I told you they were real. Honestly, I'm going to talk to you about something way cooler than little green guys from another planet. This word meant an exile, a pilgrim, or a sojourner. It's used in only two other verses in the New Testament, and I want to read them to you to help us understand. And fortunately, one is in Peter again, 1 Peter 2.11. <clears throat> Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against your souls. And so you guys are aliens and strangers you don't belong here, and because you don't, there's warfare, there's, there's flesh and lust and these things that are coming against you, and because you don't really belong here, I want you to abstain from these things. And then again in Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, the Hall of Fame of Faith, all of these died in faith, these great men and women of faith. They never, without receiving the promises, having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles, there's our word, on the earth. We are, we are journeying. This is not our home. We are journeying to our true home. They lived by faith. Everything that they did was always looking to this true home that they were journeying to. And so this term always refers to a temporary resident in a foreign place. And so let's try and maybe bring it into something that we're familiar with in our day and age, and then I, I want to apply it to you spiritually this morning. When you go to another land, when you go on a, let's call it a vacation, you're called a tourist. You just kind of go and you take in the culture, and you, you kind of stay at a distance from it. You, you, you don't learn the language, you just use them to find your way to get around what you want to see and what you want to eat. I don't want to become German, I just want a bratwurst is all I'm after from Germany. But if you get a green card, you become a temporary resident. I, I love hearing the stories, one of your elders, Robin Conwell, when he lived in Saudi Arabia with his family, and, and they, they began to engage and get into that culture. They, they were more than a tourist. 
you're in another country, but you are an American citizen still. That's your homeland. And you're functioning as part of their society. You actually do learn the language and you get a job and you have friends and neighbors and you are residents, but still not citizens. You have a home country. Your neighbors may like you, but honestly, they think you're a little different. You're blowing off fireworks on the 4th of July, the way you talk, your customs, your values, you're different. You have a passport, but you are not expected to stay forever, right? And that is what Peter uses for the word Christians. You're aliens. We are here in this world, and right now, for us, it's called America, but we're not full citizens. We're residents. We love and we engage our neighbors and we care about our neighbors greatly. But our homeland is in another place called heaven. That is our citizenship. And so here is what Peter is getting at. I want you to listen to a few more verses to get your arms around what Peter is trying to articulate here. And 1 Peter 2.10 again. For once you were not a people, but now Gentiles, you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You've been brought into this covenant of blessing. Very next verse, beloved then, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. You have received mercy. You've been brought into a new kingdom. You've been brought into a new relationship. I am not belonging here. So abstain as aliens and strangers from all the things of those who make their citizenship and their hope this world. Everything in this world is what they live for, the true citizens of this world. But we are citizens of another world. For Paul said our citizenship in Philippians 3.20 is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're waiting. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's our true home. And we're hastening and we're urging, come, Lord Jesus, today for our new home. And so, brothers and sisters, we are not home yet. We are on our way there. We are sojourning to our true home. We have not arrived while we are in these bodies, while we are on this earth. This is not home. The Christian life is pilgrimage. And you're going to struggle on this journey home. There are going to be times of emptiness and hardship and conflicts and pressures and times where you just flat out feel alone. Like, I I don't really belong here. You get that feeling a lot. I don't fit. I think different. I I just, I don't really fit here. And that's true because you're not home yet. When I traveled to Europe, I loved it. But when I pulled up to my house and I showered in my own shower and jumped into my own bed, it was like, ah, oh, home, my chair, the way I like it, my little rocking chair and my teapot. And I made honey cinnamon tea and the smell of home and the decorations the way I like it. There's just nothing like home. We'll never have that in this world. We're, we're not home yet. Everything doesn't fit with our new longings here. There's some beautiful things in this world that I truly enjoy, but there, there's an aching in my heart. I, I want to be home. I'm like, uh, what's her name? There's no place like home. Dorothy. <laughs> home, Jesus said, is with the Father. Home is with the Father. And so we already have home waiting for our true home. We are in exile. We, we lost paradise. And so uh, this world isn't home. And so what I want to exhort you this morning is don't put your tent stakes down here. And, and don't try to act and live like this is home. We're residents just passing through to our true home. Amen? Don't make this home. I see people just grasping and clutching to try to make this home. It isn't. I'm an alien. I'm a temporary resident. I'm a sojourner to my true home because of the grace of God. And so this world has a God, and it's called Satan. And the system is built by him, and it's built on lies and deceits and, and murders. And this, this whole system then is, is to show everything that God isn't. 
And, and uh, we're, we're not to love it, John said. Don't love this world. It, it loves what we hate and it hates what we love. It, it is not our home. And so just uh, maybe a note to the unbeliever. If this world is all there is, why are you so unhappy? If we've evolved to fit our environment, why is everybody so unhappy? Because you're not home. You're not home. You were made for fellowship with God. And the heart will always be restless till it finds its rest in thee, O oh God. True home is the presence of God where we wait eagerly for a Savior. So why are we aliens in this world? Because we're not home yet. We really don't fit this world. We have been brought out of it. And we walk to the beat of a different drummer. We have a new constitution uh, Peter says this is by an, a Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is one who has authority. When he spoke, he's speaking for God himself. As he writes these letters, this is God himself writing through him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we have a new constitution. We have a new authority. I want you to listen to the preamble of our constitution here in the United States. It says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. We do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. And now we have a new constitution. Our true home, we have a perfect union in John 17 uh, you are one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can't have a, a greater, deeper, sweeter union than what we have in this union with God and each other. Establish justice. God has established justice to do justly. To ensure domestic tranquility. Jesus says, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave you. To pro provide for the common defense, we have the armor of God and the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Our general welfare is that he causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, as we just heard this morning. And the blessings of liberty is you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free, and now you will walk in the freedom and the power of knowing Jesus Christ. Guys, we are aliens. We have a whole new constitution, and it is called the Word of God. And we, we now follow this constitution. This is it. And we bow before a whole different king now. The apostle spoke for Jesus Christ. We submit to him. This whole thing in verse 2, he says that to bring about the obedience to Jesus Christ. New citizens who obey this word and we obey the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our constitution. We live for new cravings that have come when we were born again in verse 3 to a living hope. New desires for the king himself and his kingdom. So you, do you see why we are aliens? We're strange. In this world that is everything contrary to God, we cannot fit and we do not fit. And so I'll ask you the question I think Peter wants us to get if we're going to suffer well. It's rising up in my heart and I hope is yours as I'm speaking. Do, do you belong here? Do you belong here? Are you trying to fit into this system? Some of you, that is your goal to fit into this world that hates God and is passing away and perishing. Does this world love you? Do you fit its thoughts and its dress and its culture and its customs and its actions and its pursuits? Is that your goal? The, the church in America has so much worldliness that has crept in and into our hearts. And this morning, are you an alien? If you live this way, you're going to be rejected, and you're going to be persecuted and not liked, and you're not going to be real popular. Some of you kids, you're going to have to eat lunch alone by yourself some days. And you might have to sit home on Friday nights. If you're uh, college age, come see me here on Friday nights. You're not going to be the one that everybody asks to prom. And in fact, one day, as Peter, one day they might want to crucify you and hang you up on a cross. And so let me make some application before I go on. Is, 
What, what will this look like then if, if we have this dual citizenship? We're to be the best citizens in America, and yet our citizenship is not here. It's in, it's in heaven. What, what does it look like to be these people with a dual citizenship? Peter will answer that, I think, in the rest of this epistle. But I'm going to try to just summarize it now, and I'll keep showing it as we journey in our study. So my question is, how do I live in Denver, Colorado? And the first is not withdrawal. It isn't then that I withdraw from everything because I'm a citizen. And, 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 and we're going to see in Scripture, and Peter, it's not going to say just get away from everybody and lock yourself up in your house and in your room. That isn't going to be the answer. It's not withdrawal, and yet it's not assimilation. It's not going to be getting in and begin letting the world conform us to its image. So we don't assimilate with it. We get in as aliens, strangers who are passing through with this gorgeous message of the gospel and the power of it. So we don't withdraw and we don't assimilate into the culture. I'm not a tourist just using everyone and everything in America while I'm waiting to go back home. I'm, I'm an exile, an alien, a sojourner living in Colorado not assimilating into this culture, but entering into it to love it and to shine the light of Jesus Christ to this culture. And 1 Peter 2.11, again, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. And so I really want you to hear this. If you're going to live like an alien in this world, there, there are two responses by this world then that we live in. <clears throat> Peter says they're going to slander you and they're going to accuse you of all kinds of wrongdoings. They're going to hate you. They're going to mock you. They're going to do all of these things. But the second thing Peter says is they're going to glorify God on account of your good deeds. What does this mean? They're going to ridicule you and persecute you and then they're going to glorify God because your deeds are so beautiful? Some people, Peter says, are going to see the beauty of a saving God in you and be attracted to it and come to Jesus Christ and be saved. I'll tell you right now, everyone sitting in the chemo ward, when they watch that brother walk in there and what he just shared, you're going to say, what is that? Some might hate him because he has peace. And others are going to draw near and say, what is the difference? And so our lives... Are gonna, they're going to they're gonna convict and they're going to make people hate you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you. And yet there's going to be others who are going to marvel and they're going to see the power of God working within your very life. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness sake. And then he says, you are the light of the world. And, and they're going to see your good deeds and glorify your father who's in heaven. So they're going to have both kinds. They're going to want to hate you, kill you, and there's going to be those who are going to marvel at the good deeds saying they had to come from God. There's two responses to aliens from this world. So if you live like aliens, if you live for your true homeland and your king, and if you live by his constitution, you'll be persecuted and hated, and you'll be extremely compelling. Christianity in Peter's day was offensive. And both beautiful. They were hated and they were eventually killed for their light. But Christianity grew like wildfire because of the attractiveness of it. And some of the reasons why, just reading around this week, is they forgave like no other. Their generosity was not just to their own. They said they were generous to, to all people. They took suffering and death with joy, many of them singing as they were being killed. And they had sexual purity that only remained in the covenant of marriage. Guys, I pray that we would not assimilate into our culture. I teach a group up at DU. And as I get on these campuses, I get to see there's just so many who assimilate into the culture of sex and partying and drugs and alcohol. They just they assimilate into it. We, we can't do that. But we cannot respond with withdrawal. We have to reach it with the love and the message of Jesus Christ. To be in the world but be unstained by it, said James. The guy I heard this week said, how are you doing in this? Are you offensive? 
but not attractive? Or are you attractive but not offensive? And the worst thing he said is you're neither. You're neither offensive nor attractive. How, how is the world viewing you? If all you are is offensive, then you're missing it. And if all you are is attractive and everybody likes you because you're such a good guy, then you're missing it. A true alien is going to be one that is hated by some and others are going to see the beauty of God and want to come to Jesus Christ. There's two responses to true aliens. And so I want you to wrestle with, am I assimilating? Have I withdrawn? Am I offensive and attractive as I'm an alien and sojourner in this world? This will show you if you're really understanding the heart of this gospel. All right, I'm going to close out with one last point. We'll save the rest for next week. Uh, It's really important that we get this because we will not be prepared to suffer rightly without this second point. So the the question is, if we go into trial and this great persecution breaks out, are we going to come out of this fire burnt up like a little cinder? Or are we going to come out of it uh, with pure gold? the refiner's fire, and we're going to come out from trial, and you're going to say, wow, look at the beauty of what has come out of that. What is going to happen when I go in the fire? Which one will come out? Which one will I be? I want to come out like Peter. Peter came out beautiful, and he's going to tell you, here's the secret of how I came out of that horrible trial and rejection of Jesus Christ. Here's how I came out. We're aliens. We're aliens, but if you look in verse 1, there's a, a, a word that's modifying this word aliens. It's, it's an adjective in the Greek. It's ek lektos, which means chosen, and it chosen out of. And so here, here it is. It, I missed this for so long. It's an adjective describing the aliens. <clears throat> this word for chosen, if you, and, and if you've got an NAS, it's an end of verse 1, to those who are chosen. It's used 22 times in the New Testament. And it always refers to persons that were chosen by God from a group. So there's a group, and and God chose you out of it. And there were others in that group that were not chosen. And they were chosen, the people that were chosen out were chosen for inclusion among God's people as the recipients of great privilege and blessing, the grace of Almighty God. So those who were brought out of it were brought in to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the family of God. They receive the fount of every blessing that comes in Christ Jesus. And so this is what is called the doctrine of election. While I think doctrine of damnation is the most hated doctrine by an unbeliever, The doctrine of election appears today to be hated by many American Christians. It doesn't fit with a culture who elects its presidents, and now the president is electing his citizens. It doesn't fit. It's not hand in glove. When everything in our country is about rights, my rights, personal rights, gay rights, we all have our rights, and all of a sudden we're told that God has the sovereign grace privilege to choose who he wants to to give his gift of salvation too. It's very offensive to an American mindset. Very offensive. Next week, I want to wrestle with this doctrine. I want to look at some of the things that might make it prickly for you uh, to make sure you understand it. I know more people who reject this doctrine who, who don't even understand the real view of it. And they throw out something they read in a book by one guy. And so I want to really open it up <coughs> and understand it. And we're going to answer next week in verse 2 that you were, they were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. And so we're going to look at that. Come back next week to wrestle a little bit more with this doctrine. Uh, I think the, the fruit and the beauty that will come from it is life-changing, and I'll share why next week. But for, for this morning, we need to understand it for the fount of blessings that come with it when it's rightly understood. So to close out this sermon, I want to keep it in context. And just a couple thoughts on it uh, this who are chosen. And the first thing that kind of jumped out with me in verse 1 is it's not hidden, is it? It's not hidden. It's, it's Peter's first word to describe believers. In the Greek, the very first word that he talks about is chosen, and then he brings up the word aliens. So he, Peter's not embarrassed about this term. He's not trying to hide it. I, I've had people say, why would you even talk about that doctrine? It's divisive. And here's Peter saying, 
Man, this is one of the most important things to understanding suffering and the Christian life and being an alien. If you don't understand this, you're going to miss out on something very, very important. So Christ wasn't ashamed of it. Paul wasn't ashamed of it. Peter is not ashamed of it. So I want you to see it's, it's a beautiful, gorgeous doctrine that can change and transform our thinking as we get a hold of it. So it, it isn't hidden. Secondly, Peter wants us to connect it then with our alien status. The verse 1 is so clear is that being an adjective is we are elect aliens. We are chosen rejected ones. It, it's really hard to be an alien, isn't it? It's tough to always be rejected. Do you guys like that? It's just not my favorite thing. Everywhere you go, you get made fun of. You're not invited to the work parties after work. Everyone's going. When they see you, they, they get quiet. You get laughed at and ridiculed, maybe physically pressured, rejected from your own family, and, and some martyred. We are rejected in this world that we reside in. It just gets hard and tiresome to always be rejected and scorned. The choice people are always rejecting us. The pretty people, the beautiful people are always rejecting us. But I want you to hear this loud and clear this morning. Peter says, you, you might not be the choice of this world, but you are God's. Your fundamental identity in this world is that you're chosen by God. I am his choice. You are the chosen, rejected ones of this world. And I pray that makes your heart want to sing and rejoice. Not that the demons listen to you, but that, the, that your names were written in the Lamb's book of life. You are not this world's choice, but you are God's. And I don't know about you, but that just helps me with rejection, doesn't it? If this whole world rejects me and God himself chose me, I don't care. <laughs> Let that overwhelm your heart this morning. The God of this universe chose you. Kind of a lame Example, but if, if every woman in this world rejects me and Laura Murphy chooses me, I don't care if they all reject me. <laughs> Jackpot. Lotto. And so if everyone in this world rejects me, if I have my true love, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, choose me, receive me, I'm good. But this fallen, God-hating world rejects me because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and he chooses me as his bride, I can do this. And I can do it with joy and I can do it with a perseverance. I'm the choice of Almighty God. God chose you to be rejected. God chose you to be his aliens in this world, to be his citizens of another country. And so please hear what Peter is doing. You have a new identity. And this is how you're going to suffer and how you're going to live in this world that hates you and persecutes you. You've got to get this. You are elect aliens in this world passing through to your true home. That is how you've got to think about yourself. You've got to get this. Peter is not afraid to get into doctrine. Next week, we're going to explain it. I mean, in verse 2, you got the whole trinity. He chose you according to the foreknowledge of God. He chose you by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And he chose you that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. You just got the whole Trinity jumping into all these glorious, eternal, beautiful things. Trinitarian oneness and love choosing you. And Peter wants you engulfed in God, engulfed in his electing love of you. Behind you, his foreknowledge next week, I believe, is his forelove. Uh, in you, the Holy Spirit, and in front of you is that you might obey the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I see Romans 11, for from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. John Piper says, Peter engulfs us in Trinitarian election before he even says howdy. <laughs> Grace and peace be to you. He just throws us right in the middle of all of this, right out of the gate to help us as aliens survive in a hostile world that is completely against us and hates us. Here's your foundation to go enter in to this. And so this is so rich. Do you know this identity? I pray that you get this. Before the foundation of the world, 
but God had set his love upon you. Not based on anything in you to merit such choosing, just pure, sovereign, choosing grace. That is the love that every soul is looking for. Let it engulf you. I always use, I use this bad illustration, but I'm going to use it again. I don't know why. There's a song. My musician over here is going to love this. Dan Fogelberg. And Dan Fogelberg, I think he caught the heart of every human where he said, before the stars were in the heaven and the fishes were in the ocean, I fell in love with you. And he said that every heart is looking for this love that is eternal. And he's trying to say, say that the way I love you is before God created anything, I already loved you. And then you come to the word of God and it says the exact same thing, that before I even created the world, I set my love upon you. And in time and space, I drew you to myself and I opened your eyes and I gave you a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you believed and you were saved and I'm going to bring you to glory for an eternal love. So the love of God started in eternity past and it moves all the way to eternity future and nothing can separate you from it. Nothing can take you out of it. If it had nothing to do with you why God chose you, it has nothing to do with you why you could be unchosen. And it's eternal forever. God says, I chose you to be aliens in this world. And now I, I can suffer and I can endure and I can face anything because of this beautiful choosing of God to be separate, aliens, different. And so just the closing thoughts, and sorry, I'm, my goal is to be done a little earlier, but, but Bill was worth it. <laughs> that got me fired up. You can't just get that you're an alien here this morning. If you've got to get the modifier, the adjective that you're, you're a chosen alien. Because here's what I've seen as a pastor. If you only think you're an alien, you're going to beat your body. You're going to hide from society. You're going to separate. You're going to become just a bunch of, of legalists. We're, we're aliens. We, we don't belong here. Get away from them. They're bad. And I can, I can quit doing the things of this world. I'll make myself do it. I'm going to live this way. God's going to love me and bless me if I keep doing this. And it won't help you to just get in your noggin that you're an alien. But you're chosen. You're chosen in the world, uh, but not of it. And your light is going to shine. It will overwhelm you and you'll become like a, a Romans 1. When Paul got this, he said, I'm now a debtor to all men, whether Greeks or barbarians, Scythians, all of that. He said, I'm now a debtor because I received free sovereign grace. I was dying, going to hell. I was killing Christians. And God and his goodness knocked me off my horse. Paul never struggled with election. I'm going to go kill Christians. God knocks me off my horse and saves me. He never said, oh, I was seeking God first. Paul never struggled with this doctrine. And now he says, because God showed me grace that I didn't deserve, I'm going to now give my life to tell everybody about the free grace of God and salvation in Jesus Christ alone. I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor to all men. And so because I've been chosen by God's grace to be an alien, I'm going to engage this culture and I'm going to tell them I'm a debtor to tell people that there's a way to be rescued. Can you imagine if you're on a, a, a say, a 20 story building and it's burning and there's a fire and, and it's gonna, you're all going to die for sure. And someone says there's an escape route over there and you run down the escape route and you never look back and tell the other 99 people. You'd say, what's wrong with that guy? And that's what he's saying is when we get the grace of God, I'm not going to run from this world. I'm going to run to it. I'm not going to be conformed to it, but I'm going to tell them that this, this building's on fire and there's an escape. And the escape is the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I see in the church is those who don't get aliens, they're trying to fit in this world. They're drinking up the world and saying, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I can live like the world and be anything else. They don't, they don't get that they're aliens. And, and that's a wrong mindset. I'm going to go show the world I'm just like them and they can come be like me, but have salvation. That's a lie. And so when we don't understand that, that we're aliens and we just, I just want to fit in this world, you're missing it. But then there are those who they get that I am an alien, I pull out, I pull away, we don't belong. But those who I have shepherded in my own heart, when you understand that you're a chosen alien, you're going to now go make a difference in this world. And you can suffer 
well. I'm sorry, you can't suffer well until you get this. So the drink it up view, go live it up. You're going to be devastated when you lose all your earthly pleasures. You're going to be like, that's all I live for. I'm, what do I do now? I'm devastated. And a legalist, you're going to be mad because you did all the right things. How could God now be bringing this upon me? And you're going to be mad at God, and I've heard that a hundred times. But a chosen alien is going to consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials because your reward is God. Your reward is coming in full and you are waiting for what Jesus said he is going to prepare for you, a place called home, a mansion in the presence of God forever. A chosen alien can suffer and can endure and can be persecuted. And the more you squeeze them, they're like a grape. The sweeter the wine that's going to come out. You've got to get this, that you're a chosen alien. Do you know this morning that you are loved by God in eternity past? And that you don't belong here now. You will be different than anybody else in this world. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. And singing thy praises before thee I'll bow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. You chosen aliens, live into this. And go engage a world that hates us with the love of Christ. That has encompassed us for all of eternity. And some will persecute you. And some will see the beauty of Jesus Christ and they will believe upon his name. Amen? It's a beautiful foundation that Peter has given to us in the next couple weeks. We'll unfold uh, just the depths and the glories of of that being flushed out, that you're chosen and what that will do for us. So let's, let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, I thank you for this amazing truth. Lord, a doctrine that is fought against so much. And yet what it does is it should show us that before the fishes were in the ocean and the stars were in the heavens, you set your love upon us. And so God, because it was an unconditional love, it's not conditioned on us. And we thank you that we have this love that we've always wanted, we've always known and desired, and we we can't find it in humans. God, I thank you that we find it in this beautiful gospel that we looked at this morning. So thank you that you set your love on us and that love is working in our lives and it's going to bring us to glory. It's very safe to the very end. And that love, that love has changed our hearts. And because of what you've done now by causing us to be born again, we just don't fit here in this world. We we're longing for a greater home, a better place, uh, a builder and maker whose foundation is God. Lord, our eyes are looking for the celestial city. We are looking for that new Jerusalem, Lord, where righteousness dwells forever. And so I thank you that we don't fit here. And God, cause us to repent of worldliness this morning, of letting the the world get into our hearts, letting it uh, assimilate into it. God, I pray for a repentance for every believer here this morning. Lord, that we would again lift up our tent stakes. And be so focused on our true home that we would live with one eye to that, with our hope and our joy facing, running this race where the finish line is Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. God, let us fix our eyes on that. Let us groan and long for our true home. Lord, help us to quit wanting to cling here. There is nothing here that is more satisfying than Jesus Christ. I pray that every heart would see that this morning. And that they would release even little cherubs and spouses and possessions and homes, God, that our hands would be open and we say that for me to die is gain because I'll get more of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, let us love that more than this world that's passing away. Let this choosing of us set us free to be true aliens. God, to live different than anyone else And that while some are going to persecute us, some are going to see a beauty and say, what is the hope within you? I glorify God because of your good works. And so I pray that you would raise up in this church, not people who are hiding, but people transformed by these two realities, our new identity, and that we would engage this world as new creations, new people with the message of our new king and new charter and constitution that we live according to. God, let us. Be separate while we engage in love with the gospel of Jesus Christ.
Do your work in every heart for where it needs it this morning. And for any unbeliever, God, who has walked in here this morning, that they would realize they, they can't find happiness in this world because they've, they've been made for something bigger. And home is truly being reconciled and brought back to God as Adam once dwelt. God, let them this morning see their great need, their great need to be delivered from God himself as in the Lord Jesus Christ who came into this world and died a death on a cross for our sin and lived the life that we could never live that you would now give to us. God, give them eyes to see and let them call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ even this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.